So, hello. My name is Adeshewa Adesiji. I'm the Metro Area Workforce Strategy Consultant with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, DEED for short. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to our first one on one conversation with DEED's Workforce Strategy Consultants. So, as you may or may not know, May is Technology Workforce Month here in Minnesota. Tech Month, for short, uh, is an opportunity to draw attention to the critical importance of the state's technology workforce and its key role in Minnesota's economy. Now, before we begin our wonderful interview, uh, here are some data for those watching this recording. So, did you know that Minnesota is home to about 111,000 people working in information technology occupations? Now, that is 4.1% of the total employment in Minnesota while the national average for such occupations is, is at about 3.6%. That means that information technology work is more concentrated in Minnesota than in the nation as a whole. Now, DEED does project employment in computer occupations to grow by 12.12% between 2020 and 2030, while the average growth for all other occupations in Minnesota is at about 5.7%. Lastly, because of the high demand for information technology workers, wages for workers in tech occupations are higher than for most occupations in Minnesota. In fact, the medium hourly wage for information technology occupations was at $49.39 an hour in 2022. That's nearly $25 an hour higher than the median for all occupations in the state. Look, I don't know about you guys, but it's safe to say information technology has a very strong presence in Minnesota. So with Tech Month being next month, what better way to start Tech Month but with an interview with the president and CEO of the Minnesota Technology Association, Jeff Tolson. Now, I've had the opportunity in my role as a workforce strategy consultant to interact with Jeff and Mintech on several occasions, all very positive. So I want to thank Jeff for taking the time out of his busy schedule to share his perspective on the technology industry in Minnesota. Before we get into the interview, Jeff, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thank you, Adeshua. Thanks for uh, allowing me to join you today. And uh, I didn't realize this is the very first of your deed interviews with those in the tech community. So honored to be here. Yeah, so I, my name again is Jeff Tollefson. I serve as president of the Minnesota Technology Association. Uh, we're a coalition of approximately 200 member companies that are really united in trying to build a stronger, more innovative, and importantly, a more inclusive tech ecosystem in our state. And the way we do that is leveraging partnerships with a lot of our larger member companies, uh, helping drive public policy initiatives, um, and thinking about how do we build the tech workforce that all, all of our employers need for continued business success. I've been in that role now for almost four years. Prior to that, I spent time uh, with a tech internship program called Genesis Works, and prior to that, a uh, career in uh, venture capital, investing in tech startups. So uh, happy to be here. Thank you so much. And once again... <laughs> Thank you for, for taking time out of your schedule. So let's get into the questions. Um, I actually, one of the questions, not trying to spring it on you, it's not on the list that we sent to you, but it's a, a, a general question. Um, in your opinion, have you seen an increase in uh, participation in, uh, in um, participation from businesses in the industry wanting to uh, work with workforce development ecosystem, getting more people into tech industry, because sometimes that was usually considered, you know, a challenge is getting employers to be engaged in, in work towards, meeting in the middle, I'd like to say. Um, in your opinion, have you, seen, have you seen an increase in interest from tech employers about what skill sets are out there, what they can do to kind of, um, provide their their feedback, their thoughts, their input on training and, and, and preparing people for the industry? Yeah, I think we're seeing more engagement because they have to engage differently. Um, I think as companies are waking up to the future talent needs and challenges that we face as a state, uh, I think employers recognize they just can't sit back and expect 
our public education system and our workforce system to just deliver digitally skilled employment ready talent um, without their involvement. That involvement takes a, a number of different forms. Sometimes it's helping inform curriculum of training partners to make sure that uh, the training programs are aligned with in-demand uh, roles and skills. Uh, it means thinking differently about how they show up for public policy advocacy. I'll use an example around computer science education. Um, sadly, today, Minnesota ranks last in the country, 50 out of 50 states. Uh, in terms of the percentage of higher high schools that even offer a foundational computer science class, we have put forth uh, legislation this year to uh, uh, called the Minnesota Computer Science Education Advancement Act that would take us from last to first place over the course of the next five years. And it's been great to see our business community aligning behind that, whether it is signing on to a letter called CIOs for CS, as we've got chief information officers to support computer science uh, education to a whole host of other things. We're seeing uh, new engagement and, and stronger engagement from our business community. So the short answer is yes, we're seeing more involvement. Can it be better? Yes. And hopefully that will continue to be the case. Great. Thank you for that. Um, and so that kind of then segues into one of the questions um, you had mentioned about the act and, and getting Minnesota from fifth to first place. And so I wish there it was, was fifth to first. It's fiftieth. Yeah. Oh, fiftieth to first. I'm sorry. We, we are dead last. So we are dead. Yeah. Not good. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of work. We have to do better, Minnesota. Yeah. Um, so so the your VP of talent, Joe Crandall, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, had wrote an article addressing the tech talent development in Minnesota. And so he kind of mentioned some of the things that you mentioned, um, that although the tech ecosystem is providing new ideas and, and Minnesota's with high paying jobs, there's still an issue with lack of both homegrown, skilled, and diverse professionals. So basically, you know, we're not focusing on DEI and tech, yep. or we're not focusing on growing our own, so growing from within. And so, you know, you... We you talked about um, employers um, being more engaging and 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 being more involved in this. Um, do you feel like there's still not enough communication between employers and other stakeholders? Um, so the edu you know in addition to educators, other you know workforce development you know entities um, is workforce develop. Is workforce development missing the mark when it comes to understanding the employer's need? Because that is a big thing, too, is not listening to the employer, always providing solutions without listening first. So, yeah, you bring up a lot, of, a lot of interesting <laughs> points here and a lot, to, a lot to cover in a short answer. So, uh, yeah, so Joel, when he wrote his blog post a couple of weeks ago, really was honing in on our desire to help lead a collective push to equitably double the development of new technologists in our state over the next 10 years. Uh, because we continue to see increased demand from our employer community. And you mentioned kind of that 12% growth rate that DEED is projecting for tech roles. Uh, but we are not, so that's the demand side of the equation. If you look at the supply side of the equation, that's where the problems really begin to arise because we are seeing uh, demographic shifts as our labor force is aging. We have a lot of baby boomers that are going to be re kind of leaving the workforce over the next 10 years. Labor force participation rates continue to not be where we would like them to see. Uh, and we have a, a more diverse population that we're trying to develop skills around that um, we haven't paid as much attention to these historically overlooked and untapped talent pools as much as we should. So we need to be thinking differently in terms of how do we hire and how do we develop talent. Um, so kind of go to the other part of your question around kind of a communication link is that maybe broken? Yeah, I would argue that it is broken. 
Um, I think companies don't always know how they can best engage with workforce agencies. And for some of the more highly skilled roles, software developers, cybersecurity analysts, uh, those that are in data engineering, I don't think companies have historically believed that our workforce system is producing talent in those particular roles uh, versus those that might be in you know, healthcare services or transportation drivers, et cetera. So I, I think there's not necessarily a knowledge that they can or could be engaging in our work with our workforce partners uh, in, in a more impactful way. So I think that is an opportunity for improvement looking ahead. Good, thank you. So that then that segues way into another question. Um, we, you talked about DEI and, and the lack of outreach to um, diverse communities. So, you know, of course, there's an interest, interest in tech across the board, across all industries, BIPOC, non-BIPOC, women, disability, everyone. Um, we know that in Minnesota, the demographics are projected to change and become more diverse. Yeah. Um, I always share the data that between 2018 to 2053, I think, um, is the year that the only decrease that the state of Minnesota is going to see overall uh, with populations is with the white, non-Hispanic, male, or Latino. Yeah. Everyone else yeah. is expected to increase. So with the change, with the employers now recognizing that they need to reach out to more diverse communities, with diverse communities saying, yes, you know, we want to have larger representation in the tech industry. Do you see DEI still being a challenge, not only in 2023, but just moving forward? Like, how do you see, it, it, would the, is the challenge, do you think the challenge is going to get tougher before it gets easier or if you think it's just going to be smooth sailing because everyone yeah. is kind of on board that yeah. you need to reach out to these communities. <laughs> yeah, it, it continues to be both a challenge and it continues to be an opportunity. Um, companies, particularly the, the larger companies that who we primarily work with. So our membership really consists of a lot of large tech enabled companies. The targets the United Health Groups, Medtronic, 3M, Ecolab, so forth, that are, that's who we primarily are trying to, to serve. And they have significant needs and they want to diversify their IT talent. Um, if you look at uh, diversity by certain roles, software developers, I think it's only about 2% are Black. Uh, only one and a half percent would be Latinx. When you compare that to the general population of our community, we have a huge disparity, a huge gap. Uh, and companies recognize the value that diverse teams bring in terms of you know, economic success for an organization. Yet they have struggled to find the talent. Now, are they fishing in the wrong you know, talent pools? One could argue, yes, you can't keep going back to the same colleges and universities that you've always recruited from and expect to have a different result. We need to be thinking differently about our hiring practices. How are we willing to go to boot camp graduates that might have a degree that was earned 10 years ago in a different field, but now they've developed some skills in IT through a 10 to 15 week boot camp, we do see organizations that are willing to take on a little more of that quote risk. Um, I, I'll use Target as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, through their uh, their EMIT program, have had great success in doing that. And U.S. Bank partnering with Summit Academy. Um, there are examples across our metro of organizations that are doing it well but we do need more. Now, in the short term, it's gonna be difficult. Mm -hmm. um, what has happened uh, starting really last fall is fears of recession were beginning to take hold and budgets got set last fall for 2023. Um, we've seen hiring really begin to slow down as companies tap the brakes. We're not seeing huge tech layoffs the way we've seen on each coast, but we've seen a slowdown in hiring. 
and it is impacting uh, those that are graduating from boot camps, maybe disproportionately. Um, so we're going to see some tighter hiring uh, conditions than what we've experienced over the last four to five years that probably will continue to play themselves out over the next 12 months. But Tech is the enabler. Tech is what companies need to be, you know, really driving either AI or uh, other tech-fueled business models forward. So we do see that demand coming back, uh, despite what might be a little bit of a near-term pause. You know, one of the things, uh, side note, uh, that I like about this interview is that you make it easy to segue into the next question. Oh. <laughs> so, thank you for that. That is helpful. <laughs> well, I think, you, I think you answered the next question I actually had was, you know, um, about layoffs. So on each coal, either coast, IT is, 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 you know, workers are being laid off. And while you feel that, you know, you think that hiring is going to slow down here in Minnesota, you don't necessarily feel like it's going to work its way into, you know, the middle of the country and, and hit the Midwest. So we're not going to be experiencing like mass layoffs like each coast. Or do you think, eh, you know, what, yeah. what what's the what's the likelihood, I guess? Yeah, and, you know, and it's really hard to say. So for, first of all, as we look at, quote, big tech and the big layoffs are happening at Meta mm -hmm. and Google and uh you know, yeah. Amazon and so forth, Microsoft. The first round of cuts that we saw in a lot of those organizations were not necessarily IT roles or software developer roles. They were marketing, um, you know, uh, recruiters, uh, others that within the technology organization that were core to developing new innovations. Now, that said, in some recent months, that has begun to happen a little bit more, where software engineers and developers are being let go in maybe kind of round two. Um, let's look at what's going on now in the Twin Cities. We have seen job postings decline over the course of the last 12 months. There was a kick back upward in the month of March. Um, with I believe it was just over 9,000 IT job postings. So companies are still hiring. It's just the rate at which they're hiring has slowed down. We were seeing on average between 15 to 20,000 unique postings a month. And now we had kind of dropped below that 10,000. The layoffs that we're seeing uh, in the Twin Cities uh, tend out to be uh, focused on traditional IT roles. Doesn't mean it's not happening, but it's not disproportionately affecting that the way, you know, maybe it is in other parts of the country. And I think part of the reason is we're blessed with a very diverse economy in Minnesota that we aren't just big tech. You know, we have certainly some technology producers like Seagate, 3M produces some technology, Medtronic, medical technology. But we have a lot of companies in ag tech, like Cargill, Lando Lake, CHS, FinTech, like U.S. Bank and others, um, retail technology through Best Buy and Target and SPS Commerce. Those industries aren't getting hit quite as hard. So the technologists that work there uh, aren't seeing their jobs being, uh, you know, rem terminated yeah. <laughs> is, is the term, uh, you know, as much as we're seeing in some other industries. Hopefully that will continue to be the case. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I always say about tech that I like is tech is a strong industry within itself, but it's one of, if not the only industry that's incorporated in other industries. So like you mentioned, yeah. Uh, tech and ag, tech and manufacturing, tech and healthcare, tech and construction, tech and retail. Like there's so many different components and reasons. And I think that's that contributes to Minnesota's strong footprint, you know, in the tech industry when Absolutely. it comes to it, is that it's just so diverse. It is. It's not a Every company is a tech company today. 
Well, it's like you could be a cyber, you know, work in cybersecurity, but you could be cybersecurity in tech in one of these industries. Right. And so, you know, for someone, for a, for a young adult that likes working with their hands, but also likes technology, you know, advanced manufacturing, what a better way to get them into doing something that they love. Whereas, you know, traditional tech, you get them in the tech, but it's not that passion working with their hands, you know, and that might be what they want more than tech. So, you know, yeah, I always say that that's the one thing about Minnesota's tech industry that I like is that it's it's just that strong. So, yeah. But yeah. And it's also created a hiring opportunity for a lot of our local companies. And I've heard from many of our members that they've been able to hire great talent out of Google, out of Microsoft, those that now wish to put their technology skills to work to a, with a mission-driven organization that aligns with their own values, whether it's sustainable resources through water treatment at Ecolab, how do you help the uh, improve health outcomes in, in lower costs of health care by working for an organization like Optum, or uh, how do you uh, you know, really help solve the world's medical technology problems through a Medtronic. Lots of opportunities here to uh, put your skills to work uh, in a mission-driven organization, not you know just creating another social media platform. So, are you seeing that, or are employers seeing that um, now? With you know, right now we have about five generations in the workplace. And so what we call, you know, millennials or Gen Zs, Gen Zs are identified, I think, between the ages of 11 and 26. So the older Gen Z or older Gen Zs, yes, are in the workforce now. Um, do you, do employers see more candidates that kind of want, like, they're, they're asking about, you know, um, they're, 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 like their missions, you know, like you said, what they do outside of like, you know, if, it, if it's for a purpose, are, are more employers experience that their candidates are saying, okay, I like tech, I like ag, but I want to work in ag tech for a company that is focusing on, you know, the environment, producing more food, better way to, you know, yep. it, employers are seeing that. Okay. No, absolutely. And because aligning, it, it's hard to find motivation if you're not passionate with the purpose of the organization too. And that's what drives a lot of innovation. Um, so we definitely are seeing things like that. And you mentioned the multi-generational workforce. Um, you know, and it's not just young people that are trying to align with mission and so forth. I think it really is across the board. The other thing that we're beginning to see is a difference in those that were thinking about retirement now seeing that you know, maybe there's going to be a longer ramp in, in terms of how long they want to continue to work. Um, and so it's been interesting to see companies looking at more experienced individuals uh, and keeping them, you know, happy through remote work opportunities, things like that, that provides a little more flexibility as a means to keep on board uh, some of the uh, knowledge and experience that comes with kind of the baby boomer generation. So uh, a lot of disruption in the workplace um, and between hybrid workplaces and work from anywhere opportunities, uh, you know, the, the future of work is very different from what we saw pre-pandemic. So, okay. So I have to apologize again, because this is another question <laughs> that I just thought off the top of my head, not difficult. <laughs> I'm not going to surprise you, but, but, you know, for individuals, for job seekers, for youth, young adults, you know, just people that are uh, get, uh, career changers, they want to get into, to, to tech. What are some of the things they can do to prepare themselves? Like, I, we all know that, you know, actual training, knowledge, you know, going to short-term training or a school, you know, depending on what um, what they want to do. But what are some of those pre-activities that someone can do? Like if, if, if I'm a 17-year-old a teenage girl and I know that I want to be in tech, but I don't know where to start. I, I know that, you know, 
education is there? Like, what are some things that I can be doing even before I get into a yeah. training, educating myself? But for high school students, we're really blessed with a lot of great programs in the Twin Cities that can uh, connect youth with skills training and opportunities. Um, you know, program that I used to be affiliated with, Genesis Works, is a great example. Um, you know, it's a you undergo uh, skills training in the summer before your senior year of high school. Uh, and then during the course of your senior year, you go to school in the morning, work in an, the IT department of a local company where you can earn fifteen to $20,000 during that senior year. So, yes, you're earning good money, but you're getting relevant skills and experiences in a future forward career path. Uh, the Step Up program, Rev Academy, there's just lots of organizations. And for youth that are looking for programs, we have on our uh, MinTech website uh, something that's called MinTech Connect, that it's an online portal where you can look at and search for programs like that. For young adults, maybe beyond high school or career changers, there's also tools and in, in other uh, programs that are listed there as well. The one thing that we are beginning to see for those that are going through a boot camp is that the 10 to 15 weeks of training may not be enough for an employer to say, we're ready to hire you. There may have to be yet another step. What that step might look like is getting additional experience through programs like Genesis 10, like the crew program that is run by Turnberry Solutions, or the Barriers to Entry program through York Solutions. These organizations have relationships that already exist with employers that they're contracting to get people. And particularly, they're looking for candidates of color. And that's a great opportunity to uh, get some work experience working with what's kind of a, you know, I wouldn't call it a temp agency, but it's a contract to hire sort of uh, opportunity, a great way to get your foot in the door uh, as companies maybe are slowing down on direct hires from some of the local boot camps. And all of this information could be found on Mentech's website. Yes, yeah. Okay. MNTech.org. Okay. So for you in the audience, MN, was it Mentech? Mentech. dot org. <laughs> Yes, definitely go check it out. If you're uh, a youth, young adult, ch career changer, and you want to get into the tech industry, definitely there's those resources, you know, and, and start that journey. So so thank you and, for and that. that is um, as, we're, as we're calling out resources, yeah. we also 30 days ago launched a new resource that you can find on our website. So if you go on our homepage under news and resources, you'll find a, a link to our tech talent dashboard. This is updated every few weeks. There's probably 30 dashboards there around um, what are the most in-demand skills, in-demand jobs, what are the compensation ranges for some of these top jobs, who's hiring, you know, it has the most job posting, what's that trend, what colleges are graduating the most software engineers in Minnesota, um, what is the uh, gender and ethnic uh, breakdown of job, job by jobs within uh, certain SOC codes? So a lot of information there uh, that can maybe help guide a journey uh, towards a tech career. Yes, no, that that's awesome. That's wonderful. Thank you for saying that. Yes, definitely, you know, go to the website, go and check it out. For those in the audience that's interested um, in a career in tech, not a job. You only get careers in tech. That's different for a career in tech. Definitely, well said. you know, go to those uh, to that website and those resources. Thank you, thank you so much. I have a, a few more questions, and then we will be done. So, um, let me see. So, so I think you'd mentioned uh, AI. Just in, in so we're 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 hearing about a lot about AI recently. You know, some good, some bad. You know, yeah. the bad with with with. 
uh, people being able to utilize that, you know, in negative ways, um, but also some good ways about, you know, AI being incorporated. Um, what's going to be AI's influence in the tech world, like moving forward? Um, yeah, you know, yeah. AI has always been, you know, a, a, a driving force in technology. But it's like and it's I stronger think, now, like it's, there, it's more talk it about is. it now. I mean, the, the, yeah. the introduction from OpenAI, which is supported by Microsoft, of ChatGPT and how the kind of the public has embraced that. Um, and it's a fascinating tool. I used it just last night. Uh, and we're hosting an event next week called Tech Connect at the St. Paul yes. River Center as part of Tech Month in, uh, in Minnesota. And I was kind of stuck on a couple of questions I wanted to ask some CIO panelists. So I put in in chat GPT, what's a good question to ask the chief information officer of CHS Inc? And it came back with some really interesting ones around what's going on in technology and agriculture, prescriptive farming with drones and, and uh, autonomous tractors, um, and how AI is kind of changing how we look at uh, genetics and crops. So it, it opened up a whole new thing for me. So there's a lot of great things that AI can enable. Now, also with Tech Connect next week, our opening speaker <clears throat> is Matt Versaggi. He was leading, a, he's a distinguished engineer and led a lot of AI and machine learning initiatives at Optum. And he's going to kick it off with looking at you know, some other unintended consequences that can happen with the intersection of quantum computing and, and artificial intelligence. What does it mean to be able to biohack the body? And what if, if genetic coding got into the wrong hands? Um, what does this mean to our geopolitical system? Uh, there's a lot of interesting facets to the rise of artificial intelligence when it's combined with high, high, high speed computing that is scary, quite honestly. And if you get bad actors in China, Russia uh, that are equipped with the ability to monitor everything that we do and be able to know where we are going to go next. There's a lot of dark elements to the ethical elements of, of AI as well. Now that said, the benefits to our business community, our world far outweigh that, but we have to be mindful of some of the unintended consequences of, of technology sometimes as well. So AI is going to be more beneficial than detrimental. Absolutely, Definitely. without question. Okay. And then I actually I agree with you with that too. <laughs> All right. So here's one. Um how big can or should tech be? So is there such a thing as too much tech? <laughs> and I see the <laughs> Yeah, you know, I don't even know how to begin to answer that out of It's just like, you know, can there be enough, uh, you know, joy in the world? Or, you know, it's technology has always been a great enabler. And sometimes it's low tech, starting with the wheel. You know, it's yeah. just, yeah. you know, over time, innovation rises to meet world needs in different areas, yes. whether it's world hunger, public health, how do we communicate? How, how has this little device, you know, my cell phone, become a computer in my pocket? It's my camera. It's how I watch videos. Um, all of this is now integrated in one little easy to carry device. And I really, you know, when we think about how far smartphones have come, you know, since the old brick cellular that we used, I can only imagine what this might look like 20 years from now. So can there be too much technology? If technology is used for, uh, for nefarious purposes, then yes, that's too much. Um, 
technology is of concern. I was actually at a, a Senate Judiciary Committee meeting on Monday. Uh, there's a, an act that is being uh, put forth in both the House and Senate around social media. And the intent of the bill is great. It's how do we protect our youth, particularly young girls, from unwarranted uh, targeted advertisement and content on big social media platforms. Um, that is something that we need to address, but we have to be mindful that we don't, in our effort to solve one problem, create a lot of downstream consequences that impact other businesses, our access to information. So as we look at how big of tech, it's always going to be a balance. And if it's tech for good, I'm all for it. If it's uh, <laughs> tech that is, you know, has kind of a bad element to it, um, we need to really be thoughtful of how we roll that out. Well, I want to say thank you for entertaining that question. I just had to ask it. It <laughs> was like, I know he's going to look at me like, why are you asking this question? But thank you. For <laughs> well, sorry for the long answer. No, no, this is, it was great. It was great. It was very great. Um, so let me see. Um, we talked a little bit about um, people getting prepared, preparing themselves for the tech industry. And so one thing that I've learned about tech and I've been told by employers, by training, trainers, educators, um, uh, anyone that is involved in the industry is credentials and skill sets that you have today might not be needed as much tomorrow. So for example, um, cybersecurity, that's a big thing right now. That's like one of the top occupations within tech. However, who's to say 10, 15, 15 years down the line, that might not be, or even five years, let's say five years, that might not be the case. Um, what do you see as some of those, just the basic baseline skill sets that people in this industry need to have, yeah. but then also what do you see as the current and upcoming skill sets needed for longevity and its success in the industry? Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting question and it, it has a lot of different directions on an answer. And one, just talking about like cybersecurity and, and whether those skills you know, might become outdated for one, there's always going to be a need for cybersecurity professionals because mm -hmm. our ability to control and secure access to information and the distribution of information, it's always going to be an issue. What those particular skills, much like learning software coding, you, it may be Python today, but it's you know going to be another uh, language tomorrow. So I think what becomes important is to be digitally fluent and digitally literate, where you're open to learning new things because you're always going to have to evolve your skill sets and technology. Um, having a base knowledge of an area of focus like cybersecurity, like data, like coding, the particular skills within that might change, but your experience set in that broader area of what to be mindful of in developing solutions, I think will always carry some value. So um, it's good to be focused on an area, um, but just know that you're going to be a continual learner. Uh, otherwise, you're going to uh, date yourself right out of a job someday. So that that continue, that need or that that passion for continuous learning would be I think, you know, something that's needed, like you're. You, yeah, you, you've got to be it, intellectually it, beyond, curious. Yes, yeah, thank you. So it's, be, it's, it's, it's being, you know, goes beyond getting that associates or bachelors or or whatever, you know, certification. You're going to constantly have to be in learning mode to to be successful in this industry. Yeah. And that's good because, you know, a lot of people, they say, well, you know, as soon as I get my my degrees or my credentials, I don't have to go to school no more. And it's like, well, no, if you want to stay in this industry and be <laughs> successful, you're going to constantly be learning. You're not going to yeah. have to do four-year programs all the time, but it's going to be no. short-term here, short-term there. You know, so you're right. And yeah. I, I'll, I'll throw out an example because it's, uh, you know, one would think that once you become a a chief technology officer at a Fortune 500 level company 
or just slightly below that, you don't have to learn anymore. You made it. You're done. You're good. Everybody else needs to learn. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite CTOs in our community is a guy named Jamie Thingolstead, who leads technology at SPS Commerce, a really successful public company. Jamie is the quintessential continual learner. Every week for, I don't know how many years, it's probably getting close to 10, he writes a blog that he publishes called The Weekly Thing. You could Google The Weekly Thing by Jamie Thingolstead. And I am astounded week in, week out of what he's reading about, learning about, and sharing his commentary on. And he, to me, epitomizes what it means to be intellectually curious and always learning and always kind of staying up on things. Not everybody has that, nor does everybody need that level, but you've got to have some desire to want to learn about new technology, new innovations. Uh, otherwise, your career will get dated in a hurry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so for the, those in the audience, sorry, you're going to have to continuously learn and, and, and update your, your, your knowledge of the tech industry. Yeah, it's not just a four-year degree and you're done. <laughs> so, and that's, you know, honestly, for a lot of other industries, it's, it's that, that desire to want to continuously learn and, and, and update yourself on, you know, newer things, the newest things that are happening in that yep. industry. So, all right, so I have... Wow, two questions left. Okay. Two. Wait, one on the list, one that's not. So, <laughs> so, Bring so it. the one on the list, what's next for tech, for MTech, Minnesota Tech? For, what, for what, MinTech? Yes, MinTech, thank you. What is yeah, next for you know, so for the Minnesota Technology Association, a lot of what we're doing is kind of what we always do. I mean, we're a trade association, so our, our life doesn't change a lot. There's still a lot of public policy and advocacy we work. The, the, the bills that we get behind and those that we have to play defense against, those always change, but that's still a lot of what we do. What is changing, though, is how much focus we're putting on our second pillar, which is tech workforce development. And we want to be able to uh, be a trusted convener and a unifying voice of our business community as we're working with uh, public institutions, for education, for workforce groups, uh, to make sure that um, we can be that voice of the employer uh, with DEED and with other organizations as it relates, relates to technology. And then the third area that we're really focusing on is around community building efforts. How do we create more peer-to-peer -peer learning experiences for member companies, things like this Tech Connect event that I mentioned for next Wednesday. Um, you know, so we're trying to bring together technologists to learn, share, collaborate, um, and we're going to be doing more of that in the coming years. So it's maybe not a big switch from what you've seen of us in recent years out of Shewa. Uh, it's just we want to be doing it at a higher level and with more impact. So now next week, next Wednesday, you have the Big Tech Connect event. Is that just for um, employers or can the public, people that are interested in tech? Um, well, it, it's for attend? anybody. So, for anybody, um, okay. Yeah, so uh, for those that uh, are on this call, if you're looking to get into a career in technology, uh, it's a great way to kind of learn how companies across uh, Minnesota are leveraging technology in new and different ways. Um, uh, it could be inspiring to you. And so um, if you have an interest and you're looking for that first role, uh, we can set you up with a discount code to join us next Wednesday to come and learn. Um, if you reach out to Adeshewa, she can connect with me and, uh, I can make it as close to complimentary as possible for some. And for those others, we can do a deep discount. So uh, we're always trying to get more people into our tech world. So uh, if this could be that spark that might light your fire to say, you know, I actually want to go do this, um, 
then it could be time well spent next Wednesday, May 3rd. <laughs> All right. I like that. I like how you, you tied me into it. That was, <laughs> I was like, oh, Jeff. All right. So, okay. So and and that is Shayla. I hope I see you there. You know, I, I, I have it on my calendar and I hope to be there too. I know that I have engagement. I'm trying to, well, we'll talk about okay. that later. <laughs> so here's, to have the, you. here's the last question. And so this is the one that I just uh, just came up with. So in the workforce ecosystem, I usually identify four different groups. You have employers, you have community, you have educators, and then you have economic. And so um, Mintech would fall under employers, employers including like associations too. So, but for each of those four, so employers, community, educators, and economic, um, what is one thing, what is, what is, what, you know, one thing to say, advice, you know, about the tech industry, just in a few words for each group, what, what, what would you like to say to that group? Wow. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> a tough one because it's, uh, we all have to be better. Um, you know, if you think about all those four as gears, they all have to be in sync. If one is not working properly, it's going to slow everything up because, we need employers to the table. I guess one thing I would say to employers is I still get frustrated with how many job descriptions still require a bachelor's degree when relevant skills and work experience uh, really should be what you're focused on, not uh, a diploma from a, a, a university. So let's continue to drop the barriers to entry for, for those that are wanting to get into this field uh, through those artificial barriers. For our public education system, uh, I'll start with K through 12. Um, let's figure out how we can provide uh, more relevant coursework, like coding classes uh, into our schools. Only 21% of our high schools in Minnesota even offer computer science today, and other states around us are beginning to eat our lunch. Just three weeks ago in North Dakota, they signed into a law where computer science is a graduation requirement for all graduates beginning in 2025. We're so far behind other states. As I said, we're 50th, 5 in the percentage of our schools that offer computer science, a long way to go. And that is why we're not graduating as many in higher ed in computer science because they've not had exposure in high school. And so we need to keep going earlier and earlier. Um, and then for what was the other ones you had? So, so, so the other two are community and economic. So community, you know, is I guess my question would be, you know, what can community do? So all four, I should say, to me, need to meet in the middle to make this work. Yeah. So you already said what employers can do, what education can do. So what can the community, community being unemployed, underemployed, BIPOC, job seekers, um, you know, community-based organizations, I put those under community too. Economic is deed, uh, local, city, those kind of entities. What can yeah. can can we do for everyone to meet in the middle? What's what's everybody's part in this in this game? Yeah, and, and I think for community-based organizations that are serving, uh, particularly those in, in our communities of color, um, just know that there is a strong desire for employers to engage. They often don't know how, and sometimes we have to build those connections and bridges. Um, and so Reach out to, to Joel and I at the Minnesota Technology Association. If you lead a community-based organization and you're trying to figure out how to navigate this world, um, we're happy to sit down with you and kind of map some of that out. It's a little hard in the last couple of minutes here just doing it on the call, but uh, Joel and I would love to work with you because uh, we need all hands on deck. Um, we Deed information shows that you know there's a, a about almost 95,000 new tech roles that need to get filled over the course of the next 10 years. So we've got our work cut out for us. There's people we know. There's people here that are motivated and, and want to learn about the world of technology. 
and we just need to do a better job of creating connections. So now for economic, for, for those state, regional, local, city, you know, how can how can we contribute? In your opinion, what are things you think we should be doing to contribute to growing uh, workers for this industry and just strengthening you know this industry altogether? Yeah, I, I think there's a number of areas that we need increased investment. Some of it is just marketing and branding. You know, branding of what a tech career could look like, and marketing what that could look like to parents for their kids. Um, so I think that is part of it. Um, you know, we, uh, I'll, I'll jump back on this computer science education one more time. You know, we're trying to get funding from the state for teacher training, professional development opportunities, because we can't expect schools to offer high quality education opportunities if teachers aren't prepared to actually teach the coursework. So we have to start with professional development training. We, uh, we had asked for $4 million in this year's legislative session to do such that money going to the Minnesota Department of Education. In the current bill, it got dropped and even the governor's budget to just $500,000, mm -hmm. of which $150,000 is to fund a role at Department of Education. We continue to underinvest in and, and deprioritize STEM education, and it's beginning to show. And so we need legislative leaders to step up with targeted funding for these STEM programs, or we're not going to have the technology workforce that Minnesota needs for future economic success. So um, money always helps, but it needs to be directed in the right area. Okay. And with that, we are done. Thank you. This has been wonderful. And I have to correct you, this is not only the first interview for Tech Workforce Month, this is the first one-on-one -on -one ever. So you are oh, the right. first. Yes. So so I would I like to honored. thank you, Jeff. <laughs> thank you so much for taking this hour, answering these questions, really talking about um, tech. Um, thank you for whoever is watching the recording, for watching it. Um, definitely visit the Minnesota Technology Association's website. Uh, to learn information about um, the event next week, Tech Connect, to learn about the resources, how to get into the tech industry if you're not familiar or uh, don't know how, and just just to to learn about you know the industry and, and the employers and and the events and just it's a really strong good community. So if you're interested in an industry in a career, not a job, once again, a career in IT, definitely go to that website. So with that, Jeff, I want to thank you so much. Um, would love to do this again, definitely for next yeah. year's Tech Month, uh, Tech Workforce Month, maybe some in-betweens too. Hopefully I can see you next week at that event. And That'd be uh, great. We'll and thanks for all that you do out of Shewa and, and for all of your colleagues at Deed. Uh, much appreciate your work. Thank you so much. Let me stop the recording and then we will talk. Uh, okay. So thank you, you guys. You guys have a good rest of your day.